yeah so before the break we were looking at versus um 28 29 verse 30 of chapter 10 where jesus was saying if anyone has placed their faith in this true shepherd then you are safe in the hands of the true shepherd not only are you safe in the hands of the shepherd you're also safe in the father's hands why because the father and the shepherd are one i and the father are one he says so not only do you receive my protection you also receive the father's protection and it says here the father is greater than all so you you have ultimate protection over your life if you commit yourself to the true shepherd now because jesus said i and the father are one this upsets the uh, jewish people again and again they pick up stones to stone him and uh, so now let's look at the response of jesus when these people again try to stone him um maybe we could read from verse 31 up to 39 verses 31 to 39 anyone online wants to read that's also fine then the jews took up stone against to stone him jesus answered them many good works i have shown you from my father for which of those work do you stone me the jews answered him saying for a good work we do not stone you but for blasphemy and because you being a man make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God come, and the scriptures cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father sacrificed and sent into the world? You are blaspheming, uh, blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. If I do not do the work of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the work that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in him. Therefore they shout against the seize him to seize him. But he kept he has kept out of their hands yeah so um here the jewish people again they pick up stones to stone him because he said i and the father are one and uh, um we see this happening earlier in chapter eight where they had picked up stones to stone him at that point of time jesus just passes out from between them and they're unable to realize that he's leaving uh, you know, I think God must have temporarily blinded their eyes so that they don't realize that he's leaving and he's able to escape with his life. Uh, so we see that in chapter 8. But here, Jesus, Jesus just doesn't leave the scene. Here he poses a question. So maybe here the danger was not that intense of, you know, of him actually getting killed. And so he's able to actually speak a word. He says something which will make them examine their hearts. He says... I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Because, you see, can you find even one thing in me that is not of the Father, you know, which is sinful or which is evil or which is bad? Is there anything that you can find in my entire life, you know, which is worthy of stoning? So, because they are unable to pinpoint even one negative thing in Jesus, you know, life and uh, character and his entire lifestyle. So he says, because I have only done good. So which of the good works are you stoning me for? You know, that should prick their hearts. It should make them think, are we justified in stoning someone who has done nothing but good? Who has only ever done good? You know, it will expose their motives. They're not stoning him because they're very concerned about righteousness and Jesus Jesus has in some way you know um, gone against righteousness it's not their zeal for righteousness which is making them stone him it's actually their you know own greed 
they have become self-serving leaders. They are thieves and robbers, not godly leaders. And Jesus is exposing that. And that's the reason why they actually want to stone him. So he, he's bringing out, he's exposing that the wrong motives of their heart. And then Jesus goes on to say something in, the, in verse 34 onwards, where he says, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, you know, and he goes on to say, I am someone who has been set apart by the Father. So when I am, when, when mere humans are being called gods, when I come and I declare myself as the son of God, why are you against me? Um, so what is Jesus referring to over here? Uh, because uh, many, many years ago, uh, some very famous Christian leaders tried to bring out a wrong teaching uh, based on these verses. Uh, but then, uh, you know, later when all the other uh, leaders confronted them and said, why are you spreading this wrong teaching? You know, they, they were actually willing to humble themselves and admit that they were wrong in what they had taught. Uh, but, you know, there's this wrong teaching which is there. Uh, so I think we need to clarify this point. So let's actually look at this uh, verse from the Old Testament where humans are referred to as gods. Um, Psalm 82, uh, verses 1 and 2, and also verses 6 and 7. So I would like one of you to read out Psalm 82, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 6 and 7, please. God is ten in the congregations of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge us unjustly and are so partiality to the works? Five and six. They do not know nor. Hey, if you could just read verse three also, sorry. Three verse also. Three. Defined the poor and fatherless, do justice to the affected and needy. Now, six and seven. I said, You are gods, and all of you are children of Most High, but you shall die like men and fell like one of the Princess. Now, in this particular psalm, the Lord is actually criticizing and condemning uh, um, judicial uh, you know, the judges. He's, he's, he's basically condemning those who are, you know, uh, related with the court and with matters of justice. How they are not upholding justice. How they are, uh, you know, actually taking bribes and. Uh, helping the corrupt. So over there in, in Psalm 82, God is basically addressing such people. He has appointed these judges, uh, these important people in positions of authority so that they can defend the weak and the fatherless, so that they can uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. But these people, instead of doing that, they are using their position and power to take bribes and uh, you know promote the corrupt people instead. So uh, over there, God is very angry with them and he says, you are gods, you're all sons of the Most High. You know, that's the way you look at yourselves. You know, you think that you're very superior and very high because you're the ones who get to decide whether a person lives or dies. You know, because the judge will decide whether the, the person who has been you know, brought over there, convicted with some crime, whether he's innocent or not. And based on this man's judgment, that person will either be put to death or he'll be released. So they have God-like powers, these judges. But how are they using that God-like power? They are using it actually to harm the weak and the defenseless. So that is why God judges them in Psalm 82 and he says, even though you're like gods, uh, you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. So that's basically what God says over there in Psalm 82. Here, Jesus is talking about that verse and he says, in Psalm 82, ordinary human beings who held authority and power, they were referred to as gods, but they were just human. On the other hand, I was set apart by the Father himself and sent into the world. 
so when you're willing to accept human judges as gods who are having that kind of authority how much more you should value the words which come out of my mouth because i literally have been set apart by the father and sent into the world and he goes on to say my works clearly show you know the works which i have been doing the miracles that i have been performing they clearly show that the father is in me and i in the father so it should be easy for you to accept when i say you know that i am the son of god uh, so the old testament judges they held such authority uh, it's almost as if if they speak it's like god's god is speaking you know to use an example of um, of moses in the old testament um where you know he says to aaron um exodus 4:16 uh where the lord is saying in exodus chapter 4 verse 16 the lord says um that moses will speak to the people no no the lord is saying with aaron aaron will speak to the people for moses and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were god to him so here in exodus 4:16 it's aaron who's actually going to go in front of the people and talk to them okay so aaron will be the one who will stand over there in front of the people and talk but who who will give give him the words which he is to speak moses is the one who will actually give him the words which he which aaron has to speak so it will be like as if moses is god and whatever moses says that aaron has to faithfully go and communicate to the people so it's almost as if moses is being treated like a god okay he is holding the same authority that god would have and so whatever moses tells that aaron has to faithfully go and you know um, give to the people so the old testament judges held that kind of a power they could determine who will live and who will die they would give the decisions of god himself to the people and they were held in respect but now when the son of god himself has come these people are not showing any kind of respect for his words and so you know jesus says you know this is something in that indeed should be judged and they are so angry with him they try to seize him again but then he escapes from there so all these dialogues are recorded over here by john because the first time readers would have wanted to listen to these arguments what did jesus say how did the people respond how did jesus build his case and defend his divinity what did jesus say to defend what he you know is establishing as the truth so the first time readers it would have benefited them to know that this is how jesus defended himself these are the words which he spoke to establish his divinity so it would have these words these arguments these dialogues would have held much value for the first time readers um so okay now we will move into the next chapter um chapter 11 which mainly focuses on the story of lazarus um so maybe we could uh, start off by reading out the first six verses uh, john chapter 11 verses 1 to 6 now a certain man was sick lazarus of bethany the town of mary and her sister martha it was that mary who anointed the lord with fragrant oil and dipped his feet with her hair whose brother lazarus was sick therefore the sisters sent to him saying lord behold he whom you love it sick when jesus said that he said the sickness is not unto death but for the glory of god that the son of god may be glorified through through it now jesus loved martha and her sister and lazarus so when he heard that he was sick he stayed two more days in the place where he was all right so here we are kind of being given an introduction i you know to the story which is going to happen and uh, the so john explains john the writer explains and says you know the martha uh, the mary whom we are talking about over here this is the mary who anointed jesus feet uh, with perfume uh, so this is this has not yet happened 
this is something which she will do later after uh, you know the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So right now it has not yet happened. Uh, is this just the introduction which John is giving, explaining which Martha, because there were lots of Marthas around uh, back then. And uh, in verse 3 it says, So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. This is not just about just about anybody who's, who's falling is sick. It is somebody that Jesus loves and cares deeply about, which means Jesus will, gener will genuinely be concerned about this person's sickness because Jesus cares about this person and wants only good things for this person. So therefore, they are saying, the one you love is sick, so please come and do something about it. So they expect Jesus to do what is best for the person whom he loves. And how does Jesus respond when he hears about this person who, you know, whom he loves uh, and, and is being sick? He, this is the message which he gives to the messengers who have come to him. He says to the messengers, you know, take this message and give it to the sisters. Tell them, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So Jesus basically says to the messengers, take back this message to the sisters, you know, that the sickness is not going to end in death. So, you know, they don't need to worry. Give them this assurance. So this is what Jesus conveys. And it looks like some time after these messengers came and gave this message to Jesus, it looks like he, you know, uh, Lazarus dies. So exactly where is Jesus located and where is, um, you know, Lazarus located? Uh, if you see, um, it says in the previous chapter, verse 40, that we get to know where exactly Jesus is at this po particular point of time. Uh, if, you, if someone could read out that for us, John 10, verse 40. Forty. Yeah, I know. And he went away against beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptized at first. And there he stayed. So there in the previous chapter, they pick up stones to stone him. They try to seize him. They're not able to do that. After that event, after that incident, Jesus goes away from there. He goes beyond the Jordan and he goes to the place where John was baptizing at first where John the Baptist was first doing his uh, baptism services. Uh, where is that? We get to know that in John 1, 28, where we, we get to know the name of the place. Uh, John used to do his baptism in the beginning at a place called Bethabara. So Jesus is basically right now with his disciples at Bethabara, and the messengers come over there to Bethabara to tell him that the person whom he loves deeply is very, very sick, and the sisters are requesting that he should come and do something. And so Jesus sends the message back uh, to them saying, don't worry, this sickness is not going to end in death. But after Jesus has spoken these words, sometime during that day, Lazarus actually dies. So it would have taken one day for the messengers to go back. So on day two, day one, Lazarus is now dead. Day two, the messengers have now returned back to the sisters and they're very joyfully saying, don't worry, Jesus gave us the assurance that your brother is not going to die. This, this is going to happen for the glory of God. But the fact is that he has already died. Imagine how painful it would have been for the sisters to hear this joyful message of Jesus saying that this sickness is not going to end in death. So, and then after, after saying this, this is what John, John the writer very specifically records in verses 5 and 6. So deliberately he writes down these words. He says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, you know, what is that word so is saying? Because he loved them. Because he loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. It was out of love that he stayed 
two more days. So whatever decision was taken over here by Jesus, it is a decision of love. There are three responses which Jesus could have made. Uh, you know, the first is that in the same way that he did with so many others, he could have spoken a word of healing. And right then and there, in that other city, Lazarus would have got healed. Jesus just had to open his mouth and say, he is well. Don't worry, he's well. And that man, sick man over there in that other city would have become well in that very moment. Jesus could have done that. But Jesus did not do that out of his love. Second, um, Jesus maybe could have at least avoided giving that joyful message saying, this is not going to end in death because it's going to be very painful for the sisters to hear that. He could have avoided doing, you know, sending that message. He, maybe he could have sent some other wording like, you know, don't worry, I'll come there soon or some, something he could have said. But he chose these specific words to those grieving, you know, to the, for, for those grieving sisters. A third thing, maybe he could have at least gone with the messengers knowing what's going to happen, you know, that by, the, by the time they all reach that place, he's going to be dead. So at least he could have gone along with them to comfort the sisters. But Jesus doesn't do any of those three things. In his deep love for them, he chooses to stay back where he is for two more days. So maybe a very vital lesson that we can learn from this is that the Lord deals with our pain and suffering in a very different way from the way we would expect him maybe to, you know, act. So two times we, it is so clearly specified that this is a person whom Jesus loves very deeply. And again in verse 5, we are told that Jesus genuinely loves not just Lazarus, but even the sisters. He cares very deeply for this family. And in that love, he's responding in this particular manner. So just because the Lord allows us to go through periods of pain and suffering, where things are not working the way we expected them to go, it does not mean that the Lord does not love us. It says so clearly here that Jesus loved all three of them and he chose to respond in this way. So whatever God does to us, allows in our lives, let us remember that it is out of love. He is the true shepherd who has come to give life and life to the full. He is not like the thief who has come to steal, kill and destroy. So it's absolutely vital that we need to remember from which uh, you know, angle he is working. He is working from a place of love, not with a desire to steal or kill. Yeah, go ahead. As we know, like Jesus healed so many people, right? In the Bible, in New Testament, after Jesus, he did so much miracles. But here, Lazarus, uh, he was sick, and Jesus came. But why did he? Uh, Jesus didn't heal him. So he he only thing he he says in the previous uh, word when he went to when he gave the message to the messengers, the only thing he says is it will not result in death, and he says it will be for the glory of God. So whatever he's planning on doing, it will bring God glory. And God always glorifies himself by doing good for his people, never bad. So whatever God has planned, it is something which will bring ultimately glory to God, not disgrace to the name of God. And so in the process of, of, of this thing which God has planned, which will bring him glory, it will bring us also some good. That much assurance we can have. So Jesus will not always function the way we want him to function. But whatever he does, he will do it out of love. And he will do it for God's name to be glorified. And God always brings glory to himself by doing good. God never does evil. So we would just have to accept his sovereignty in this matter. That he as the sovereign God chose to take this decision. And of course, we see good coming out of it. But even in situations where we don't see the good which we wanted, we must accept that he is working for our good. Go ahead. Even like here, when we read these verses, we see like Jesus loved Lazarus. So he stayed two days always. Yes. So it, if like a, it's not like a, against anything, just to like a clarify. Like uh, if we love someone, in, uh, we want the person to be healed. So here, did it, didn't did that. 
yeah it's written like uh, to be god glorified but there's certain anything else is there like because it's very critical right because uh, i love some life and death yeah yeah so you know we'll we'll continue to see that so we'll, let's hold on to the thought that god is doing this for his glory okay so it is for his glory that he is doing it out of love that he is doing it so now he stays there for another two days which means day 1 when the messengers came with the message that is when lazarus died day 2 day 3 jesus continues to stay in bethbara and then on day 4 is when he speaks to his disciples in verse 7 and he says let us go back to judea okay so yes we will come to your question but let's look at the you know the way the events the way the order in which the events have been recorded for us by john the writer because he's trying to teach us something by writing in this particular way because he's the one who brought out the whole point about the love which jesus has for the uh, for this family so he, john is very clearly trying to convey something very specific to us the readers so now let's look at verse 7 onwards um maybe from 7 up to verse uh, 10 yeah 7 to 10 please then after he uh, this he said to the disciples let us go to judas again judea again the disciples said to him rabbi literally the jews lately the jews sought to stone you and you and are you going there again jesus answered are there not 12 hours in the day if any one walks in the day he does not uh, stumble because he sees the light of the world but if one walks in the light night he stumble because the the light is not in him all right so here the disciples do not know what's happening in the background i mean they do not know they just know that somebody came and said you know he's very sick and then jesus is don't worry it's not going to result in death god will be glorified so they only know about that and now jesus is saying let's go back over there so uh, they say to him rabbi you know just the other day these people were trying to stone you they were trying to kill you so is it safe for you to go back and jesus says don't worry for me it is still daylight in the sense the night time has not yet come the time appointed for me to die has not yet come so for me i'm still for me it's still day time god the 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 time appointed for me to do the good works is still not yet over so i can confidently go to judea and do the good work that i am meant to do over there because the time of night has not yet come the time for my crucifixion has not yet come so this is what jesus says uh, we don't know to what extent they understood what jesus was saying you know the disciples whether they really caught what he was saying or not and so this is the way they respond um yeah maybe we can look at verses 11 to 17 verses 11 to 17 those things he said and after that he said to them our, our friends lazarus sleeps but i go that i may wake him up then his disciples says lord if he sleep he will get well however jesus spoke of him that but they but they too thought that he was speaking about uh, taking rest in sleep then jesus said to them plainly lazarus is dead and i am glad for your sakes that i i was not there that you may believe nevertheless let us go to him then thomas who is called dittimos say to his full uh, follow disciples let us also go that we may die with him and 17 17 so when jesus came he found that he had already been in the tomb four days okay so um now uh, you know jesus says i'm going to go and wake up lazarus 
so they assume that he's sleeping so they say you know why do you want to wake him up let him sleep some more so you know he'll become healthy and well and then jesus gives them the news of what has actually taken place uh, jesus is, is is saying these things on day 4 and the death happened on day 1 so now he reveals to them and tells them lazarus died and he probably even in fact tells them he died you know 3 days back so now they get to know about it now what to do whether the whether the people are going to stone jesus or not jesus has to go you know so nobody stops him now so what mo thomas says it's so beautiful he says let us also go that we may die with him i mean his closest friend has died you can't stop him from going he'll definitely go but let us also go along with him let's not send him alone let's go along with him you know try to help him and if we die it's okay let us die it just shows the heart of thomas how much he loved the lord and how committed he was to the lord that he was willing you know uh, to go along with jesus you know he could have said you know we we'll all stay here jesus you kindly go and take care of uh, the funeral service no he they, he says let us also go along with him that we may die with him it shows the commitment you know of thomas when he says these words and so now on day 4 jesus starts off on the journey to go to bethany so which means he would have reached bethany on day 5 so now technically the body has been lying dead in the grave for 4 days okay so that's the calculation and we in fact see a verse which confirms that a little later so now when they finally come over here um this is what uh, you know um yeah there are many many jews have gathered over there um Uh, in verse 19 it says many of the jews had joined the women around martha and mary you know they've all come here to comfort uh, the sisters because of the death of their brother and uh, so it is the custom that the grieving persons will obviously stay over there in the home you know grieving and other people will come to them but here when martha hears that jesus is on the way she goes out to meet him it says that she went out and met him now earlier when jesus revealed the news about the death to the disciples this is what he said in verse 15 i am glad for your sakes that i was not there that you may believe nevertheless let us go to him so he, jesus was glad that he did not go jesus was glad that he waited two days because this is going to help a lot of people to place their faith in him a lot of people are going to be able to do that now so he's very very glad that he's giving them this chance to be able to trust in the true shepherd so that the true shepherd can hold them in their hands and nobody will be able to snatch them out of the shepherd's hands so the lord has got something very good in mind so now when mary comes out to speak to him this is the dialogue which takes place between martha and jesus um verses 21 to 27 if someone could read out 21 to 27 others said these are not sorry uh, chapter 11 yes, yes. yeah then martha said to jesus lord if you had been here my brother would not have died but even now i know that whatever you ask of god god will give you jesus said to her your brother will raise again Martha said to him I know that he will raise again in the resurrection at the last day Jesus said to her I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me though he may die he shall live and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this she said to him yes lord i believe that you are the christ the son of god who is to come into the world so here Martha you know goes running to meet him and she says if you had been here my brother would not have died um and then she goes on to say but i know that even now god will give you whatever you ask is she asking for her for her brother to be raised from the dead no no because you see later when they go to the uh, grave and jesus asks for the stone to be rolled away she says no please let's not do that because by now it's day 5 the body would have started deteriorating there'll be a terrible stench there'll be worms all covering the entire body 
so it's not a good idea to open it so she's not in any way expecting a actual rising up of lazarus right now itself she's not expecting that when she says over here even now god will give you whatever you ask she's talking about all the teachings which jesus has been giving about resurrection about how one day the dead will be with the lord forever and ever in resurrected bodies so she she believes that that, that will happen for her brother right now his body is rotting inside a tomb but she truly believes that if because lazarus placed his faith in jesus one day he is going to be enjoying in heaven with a resurrected body she truly believes this but jesus says to her he is going to rise now he says your brother will rise again and she says yes i know he will rise in the resurrection at the last day but jesus is conveying something else to her he's saying he's going to actually rise now itself i'm not talking about the future resurrection i'm talking about your brother rising up now and jesus goes on to say you know i am the resurrection and the life the one who believes in me will live even though they die and whoever lives by believing in me will never die do you believe this that's the pointed question which he asks her that those who believe in me they will live even though they die they will live and then she says do you believe this and then she says yes lord i believe that you are the messiah the son of god who is to come into the world so by jesus delaying for those two days he has now given an opportunity for so many people to be able to trust you know in him because they're going to see a miracle which is taking place on day 5 after the death this is not this is not just a few hours after the death this is 5 days after the death when the body has actually started deteriorating worms have, have formed inside the you know inside the dead flesh and they beginning to eat away at the dead body complete deterioration has completely already started and now because jesus has delayed now they are going to see clear proof that this is the messiah so many people are going to be benefited god is going to be glorified so when it comes to matters of life and death it's such a personal thing because you know the death of a loved one is just too personal and so when it comes to situations like that we may doubt the love of god but over here it says the one who believes in me will live even though they die yes they may die physically but they will live with me forever and ever in resurrected bodies do you believe this so at a time like that when it is when it's too painful to even process what is going on we got to hold on to the fact that even when it comes to death jesus acts out of love and he acts to glorify god to bring good to us god never glorifies himself by by doing evil to us he only glorifies himself by doing good to us but it may be good in the long run in the short in the, in the in the short span it may look like something very very negative i mean god could have prevented stephen's death as a martyr you know god watched while stephen was stoned to death they kept throwing stones on him again and again he bled and bled and bled it would have taken hours for stephen to die but god watched god allowed it for god's glory he allowed it and as a result of that the church was scattered and wherever the people went they carried the gospel with them imagine how many thousands came to the lord you know philip goes to a, to a samaritan town as a result of the scattering and it says there was great joy in the town that day because of what you know god allowed uh james his half brother gets uh, martyred um oh no no not the james uh, he goes on to be a great leader uh james the brother of john john uh, you know yeah um so uh, james and john that james gets martyred by uh, by Hit by herod i was about to say hitler he gets martyred by herod um so god allowed that so especially when it comes to matters of death uh we are not able to think very clearly 
but we need to recognize the fact that God allows things out of love. And of course, there are other factors. You know, I mean, when we when we have done our mentoring hours, this point has come up, and we have covered that. Sometimes it's because the person does not you know that person and that family does not really know the truth of God's scripture. So, due to the ignorance, they are una unable to claim God's healing for themselves. So sometimes death is due to uh, um, you know ignorance of the scriptures, ignorance of the authority which we carry in Christ. Sometimes, of course, death is because of uh, you know a wrong decision taken by someone else. You know, somebody else gets drunk. He drives in a drunken state, and then uh, you know your family member you know meets an accident because of that. So sometimes it's due to the wrong sinful decisions of other people. So there are many other factors also involved. Uh, but whatever may happen to us, one thing is a fact: God allows things for um, His glory and for our good okay so that's just a uh, a partial answer that i can give to your question i cannot uh, you know um, give an, a, a more clearer answer but we can have this assurance that whatever god does he does it out of love and to bring his name glory and he brings glory to his name by doing good to us not evil that's the basic thing that we can hold on to so coming very quickly to the remaining things which are given here um, you know, so in verse 33, um, okay, these are all important verses and we have only nine minutes. Okay, verses 33 to 38, if we could read out. 33 to 38, yes. Quickly, please. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? And Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb and it was a cave and a stone lay against it. Okay, the reason I wanted these verses read out is because they also contain a little bit of the answer to the question. When Jesus saw her weeping, and Jesus sees all the Jews you know, who really loved this family weeping, he groans in the spirit. The Greek word used over there is the word embrimaomai, which actually is talking about a deep anger a deep indignation about what has happened. Over here, when it says Jesus groaned in the spirit, he's angry in his spirit. He's actually indignant that this thing has happened. Please note, Jesus is not happy about what has taken place over here. He's angry. Is he angry because these people are crying? No, because he too cries. He shares in the pain which they are feeling. So he's not angry with them for crying. He's angry with Satan. He's angry with sin. He's angry with death. This is not something that he likes. This is not something that he approves of. It makes him righteously angry. God is angry with suffering and you know uh, the consequences which sin brings. So please do not think that God uh, you know, is happy with death. No, it makes him angry. It makes him in indignant. The word used over there is embri mao mai. Greek word which talks about a deep anger you know that is what Jesus feels when he sees what death has done to this entire family is angry so never think that you know God uh, you know uh, is it doesn't care when someone dies he, he genuinely cares and so some people say see how much he loved him you know it's making him, him, him try but some people say, ah, if he really loved him that much, he would have saved his life. He didn't save his life. No, that shows that he doesn't really love him. And this is the second time that same word is used in verse 38. Jesus, then Jesus again groaning in himself, embri mao mai, that same word. This time his anger is against those people who spoke those words. They questioned his love for Lazarus, you know. They did not understand how deeply he loved Lazarus, and they questioned him and said, ah, "If he really loved him, he would have, he would have, you know, rescued him." And so Jesus is indignant with the wrong judgment which they have passed against him. 
So let us who are the sheep of the shepherd never question him. Let us not be people who say, uh, if he really loved my family member, you know, he would have done this or he would have done that. So let us not be uh, reckless in the way we judge the true shepherd. So he groaning in himself, he goes over there to the cave. He says, let the stone be rolled away. Martha is horrified and she says, please, he's been dead for four days. But Jesus says, no, God will be glorified when this is done. And so in verse 41, Jesus says this prayer. You know, Jesus doesn't stand over there and pray saying, Lord, please, please, please make this man come back to life because otherwise my name will be completely dishonored. That he's not, he's not pleading over there. It's not a pleading prayer. It's a thanksgiving prayer. Verse 41, Jesus says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. It's already done. You have already heard me. I thank you. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Because, you know, it's just in the a few, a few verses back, those people, after, after Jesus spoke to them a hundred times again, they said, plainly tell us if you're the Messiah. Well, this is it. Now Jesus is clearly explaining that he is the Messiah and the Father is backing him up. So now he says this loudly, clearly, so that the people will realize that the Father is backing him up. So that is why he says, Lord, I'm saying this out loudly for your, for, uh, for, for your, he does not use the word Lord. He uses it only once when he's on the cross. Father, he says, Father, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I said this for the benefit of the people that they may believe that you sent me. So now, in fact, many people believe. So after speaking these words, Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And after all, this is the voice, you know, which, which brought everything into creation. He said, you know, let there be light and the light was there. So when this word speaks and says, Lazarus come out, Lazarus really doesn't have a choice. It doesn't matter if there are worms forming inside his body. He immediately he is restored. His body is restored back to normalcy. No more deterioration. He comes out whole, completely living and completely whole. He steps out of the grave, uh, in, in his grave clothes. So Jesus establishes the fact that he is from the Father and the Father will do whatever he asks of him. So again, you have two responses. It says here that many believed in him. That will be verse 45. But even now, after seeing a miracle on day five after death, even now there are some people who are so hardened. And I think these are the people who, about whom Jesus said, you'll be made blind because you really don't want to see the truth. So they go and report to the Pharisees about what has happened. And the Pharisees, are they all very, very happy? And do they hold a joyful meeting to praise what God has done? No. They hold a meeting to find out, to, to discuss how to kill Jesus. I mean, it shows how hard their hearts have become. They say in verse 48, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. So they are worried because now Jesus is clearly demonstrating that he is the Messiah. They are worried that he they will that you know they will they will crown him and make him king. And if they make Jesus as king, then what about Herod? Herod will immediately go and tell the Romans, and the Romans will come with their army and they will destroy the nation. So these people are so worried about their position and their power. And so they say, we should not allow everyone to believe in him. We need to get rid of him somehow before people believe in him, before they make him king. So that is the idea with which they, you know, they start strategizing. And then it, there's this man, Caiaphas, who is now holding the position of high priest. God speaks through his mouth. And the man, this is what the man says. The man says, you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. These words are not coming out of the high priest's mouth because the high priest is a godly and good man. No, he's a completely selfish, corrupt, rotten man. But God is using that position you know, of high priesthood which he's holding to make a prophecy about how one man will die for that nation and in fact for all the nations. The death of one man will bring life to all the nations. So, um, 
sometimes you know when we are in ministry and god is using us to make great things happen it doesn't mean that god is automatically certifying and approving the life that you are living if you are living a wrong life god is just using your position to accomplish what he wants to accomplish but you need to examine yourself on a daily basis to see whether you are walking in line with him you know in your ministry so uh, that's just a warning a warning to those of us uh, who are in ministry caiaphas was used by god to convey an important prophecy but caiaphas himself was not walking in a way which god approved of and he would have been punished for it so we need to be careful if, even if god is using us and our ministry he may not approve of us if we are not living in a honoring manner god honoring manner okay so yes now that we are out of time let's just close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for the lessons that we could learn from these two chapters we thank you o oh lord that if we trust in you the true shepherd and if we continue listening to your voice even when you say things to us that we may not feel like listening to if we hold on to you then we will be safe in your hand nothing and no one can snatch us out of your hand o oh lord and we can be secure in eternity forever and ever in your presence thank you for this deep assurance that we can have and so o oh lord we pray that we would be people who will live to please you rather than please humans the pharisees o oh lord only were interested in their own selfish interests they were not inter interested in glorifying you but we pray that we will be people who are different than them that we o oh lord we will live to honor and glorify you instead thank you lord in jesus name amen